That was the first record, but how did you decide on the second who was going to take the guitar parts? That was kind of like, uh, it just depended on the song, you know? Like, there was, a, there was like a song on the record I, like, I wanted to do the solo in. And I was like, and he was doing a solo, you know, that other guy. And, uh, you know, I said, man, I, I dig the tune, let me do the solo. And he was like, sure. And then, like, like for instance, I used to do the solo in Rattlesnake, but I just, it just wasn't, I just wasn't playing anything that I thought it was, like, cool. So I said, you do this. It's too hard for me. How did you and Scotty decide who was going to do what? Did we never had a problem with that. I mean, we have, like, this incredible respect for each other. Um, I mean, he's one of my favorite guitar players, and that's why I enjoy playing with him so much. He's got this thing about him where... He's not technical or anything like that, and a lot of times he doesn't even know what key he's in or anything, which is really amazing to me because he's so emotive in his playing. I mean, he just lets out these things sometimes, and I, I mean, I close my eyes and it puts me somewhere else, you know? And that's what a guitar player should do, you know? Still to this day, my favorite solo on the last record was I Remember You. I'm jealous as hell and envious of hell about that, but it's the truth and I can't lie about that. Have a favorite that you worked on? What song? Yeah. Mm, probably Quicksand Jesus was the coolest. You know, you put yourself in a vibe and you know, kind of feel your way through it. It was fun. It was really cool. Is that gonna be the first single? No. Uh, Monkey Business. You played that in Japan? Yeah, we did. It's uh, it's a little bit different arrangement now. Uh, we just changed some stuff around. You know, we listened back to it, it was like it needs a little beefing up. So we beefed it up. Now it's real beefy. Let's see, I do all the ballads. Uh, Mud Kicker, Ride Act, Creep Show. Before the first record came out, we just wanted to make sure that it was gonna come out. <laughs> that they would release it, I mean. No, I've never seen that. <laughs> I'll just make things up as we go along. We were just worried about whether, you know, how people would react to it and, and whether they would dig what we were doing or not, you know. And then, uh, you know, three years later and, you know, a couple million records or whatever, I'm pretty psyched, you know. Now, it's kind of like the same feeling again. It's really weird. This is like the first, second album we've ever had to record, you know. So it's kind of weird. You, you spend, like years and years and years writing the first record and that's one chapter of your life now it's time to put that behind us more or less and you know create a new chapter in Skid Row. There was a lot of pressure amongst ourselves to make a record that we would be proud of I and mean, we really were meticulous about the material and, and in, in writing it and arranging it and playing it we were really meticulous and there was a lot of arguing going on and, but it was all for the same goal, you know, to have like the best record, the best album that we can make. Something that on our minds will be uh, better than the first one. I mean, you never can sit there and predict like what's going to happen with your life. I mean, it, we kind of had an idea that there was something really cool about the five of us playing in a band together and that we were doing something that was right. But we never thought that it would explode the way it did. There are so many other bands that are so much more successful than we are. We're just like to be in the position that we're in, you know. And we feel like we've always felt fortunate from day one. We felt fortunate when we got a record deal and when people were digging the band and when the record got released and we were on tour with, you know, Bon Jovi and Motley Crue and Aerosmith. And I mean, it just, every everything seemed to be a plateau that kept getting greater and greater. Who's to say what could happen? It could flop and we could be back in that same bar again and at that same job. So, who gives a shit? No one can take what I already got away from me, that's for sure. I don't think rockers really think about what they're going to be doing in two years. No. Yeah. A real good chance could be working at a gas station. Yeah, you know. If uh, this album, I, I know that your personalities haven't really changed that much since, uh, since things began, but this album comes off much harder. What, what was the reasoning behind it? Well, as far as me, it probably has to do with the music I sat home and listened to last summer. I had like the Pantera CD, you know, Cowboys from Hell on my, uh, in my stereo the whole summer, just blasting that out, waking the neighbors and stuff. So you know, it's just like, it, it's just pretty much like a reflection of what you listen to. You know, I, I mean, I know Baz sat home and listened to a lot of heavy music and, 
be sending tapes back and forth saying, check this out. Listen to that. It's not big that same. The record's heavier, but it's not like a ton heavier. But it's 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 pretty much the way we want to hear it. You know? We've been around the world and we've had a chance to see and experience a hell of a lot of things. And <clears throat> I think you become more aware of a lot of stuff outside your own little world from where you grow up in or whatever. I don't know, there seems to be this anger with this pent up frustration within this band. Uh, some of it having to be with maybe not being perceived the way we felt we should have been perceived throughout the last record and the tours and stuff like that. And uh, almost being called a you know, a pop band to a certain extent, you know, and I'm like, man, this is not what I, how I want to be regarded as, you know. We never were about being a pop band. We never were about trying to write a hit song or a hit singer or something like that. We've always wrote what we felt in our hearts, and and if something, if that got, you know, uh, recognition as being, you know, commercially successful or whatever, then cool, and whatever. But it was always on our own terms. It was never someone standing over us and going, hmm, not good, you know, you got to have that killer chorus. That's one of the things that we despise about, about, you know, the music business in general is, is formulated music that's stuff that is just so generic that it makes you sick to your stomach. With this new album, we even made more of a conscious effort to, to, basically show everybody what we're really made of, you know, and and uh, to be taken more seriously, you know, and hopefully gain more respect. I mean, this isn't about, you know, top 40 singles or anything. This is about sheer aggression and anger. Standing where you are now, looking back in time, what would you have done different if you would have done anything at all different? Nothing. Nothing. I wouldn't have stuck my hand in a blender when I was about eight, but that's probably about the only thing. When I was when I was about 19, I, I got a little nervous. I was like, "Wow, is this gonna work? You know, am I gonna am I gonna be able to pull this off?" And I said, "Fuck it. What else can I do, man?" And I was just like, "I'm I'm I'm just gonna you know I wanna I'm gonna make a living playing in a band." So I found the right band and I'm making a living. How were you making a living before this kid? House painting, getting stung by bees, you know. Getting up early in the morning. I worked in an eyeglass factory. They made uh, these cases for eyeglasses, and I was like the only guy who spoke English. Sometimes we get drunk, we get obnoxious and stuff, we get fights. That's why we got this guy, right, Terry? three and blonde hair and is a great looking guy or whatever people are going to notice that right off the bat and, and maybe pay attention to that end of it more than musically what we're doing I think anybody who went and saw us live you know would realize that we really don't play off our what we look like at all it's more a case of just getting out there and banging your head and sweating and giving everything that you got with inside you know I mean no one can ask for anything more than that, and that's that's what we try to do every night. And you know, more times than not, we've been pretty successful with that. Back on when you two met each other, and you're driving around the dump truck. That man, we almost didn't even hook up, me and Rachel, because I answered I answered his ad in a music paper. You know, I threw the newspaper out with, along with his phone number, like an idiot, and he lost my phone number. So it was like two weeks there, and we couldn't get any in touch with each other we had no idea we wanted to you know get together and play and he found my number next thing i know I, like moved into his house and eating his parents food and stuff it was cool just letting out every all these frustrations that we've had inside you know through our music and music has always been an emotional outlet for me you know from the time i first started listening to the time you know i started playing it and even i can remember you know locking myself away anywhere in listening to, you know, my Judas Priest albums and my Iron Maiden records and my Van Halen records because they were an escape for me. That was an escape from my reality, whether it be a shit reality or a good reality. That was my escape, and to me, that was utopia, you know? I was in, like, my own world. No one could touch me. No one could break that bubble. Music is still that to me. I mean, my, I, and thank God now it's our music that does that for me. When we're out in a stage or in a, in a place practicing or in a studio, 
No one can touch those, you know, those confines, and those are the only boundaries that we set up for ourselves, is we stay within that bubble, and no one can penetrate that, you know, no one can penetrate that circle of our music and our, our being, you know. So, it's kind of spiritual in a sense, you know, it's only, ooh, psychedelic or whatever, but it's an escape, you know, it's, it's my own way of getting, of letting out any anger besides, you know, going and punching someone in the face or something like that. This is my release of anxiety. <laughs> we try to steer clear of, of avoid any problems with the business end of this thing as possible and and if it takes us sitting there and kicking our feet and yelling and screaming sooner or later we're going to get our own way you got to remember what you're doing this for you're not doing this for um, anyone's greed of money or anything like that you're doing this because of your love of music and your love of of getting out there in front of people and and performing for them I mean that's the reason why you play clubs and don't get paid and it's the reason why you do all the bullshit that you do to get to this point. I mean, there's a there's a reason behind it because you have a certain love for it. And and a lot of times, a lot of times more than not, the the legal end and the and the contractual ends and all the business minded ends comes into play sometimes more than the music does. And that's where you got to really draw the line. And once you see that happening, which it happens a lot. You got to be able to stand on your own two feet and say, you know, there's no way you're going to diminish my character with this crap. And maintaining your character and your integrity through all the the muck and mire is 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 the big payoff for me, you know. And I think that we've managed to do that. And um, I'm sure we'll encounter more problems down the road. I mean, our problems have have been pretty decently documented within the press and stuff like that. I mean, it's no secret the shit that we've gone through. But, you know, you stand up and, and, and you know, you state your case and, and, like I said, you kick and scratch and bite and punch and, until you get your way. And uh, that's what we've done. <laughs> can touch someone that people can relate to the lyrics and the way that, the way that we're presenting ourselves, you know, presenting the songs. You know, when, when people come up to me and, and ask me what's, you know, what's 18 in life about or, or what's I remember you about or something like that. Or, um, and they have their own opinion of it. We affected them in a way that um, that no one else did to that point. You know what I mean? Like we touched upon an emotion in them that they want to know what was this about. And I'm like, well, it doesn't matter what it's about in my mind. It matters what it's about in your mind. That's one of the greatest things that I loved about Aerosmith. I remember reading an interview with Steven Tyler where he goes, we don't print the lyrics on our albums because we want people who listen to our records to form their own opinions about these songs. That's cool, you know? It makes the, I think it makes the listener uh, more a personal part of what's going on there. I guess because we saw a lot of different stuff over the past three years or two years we were on the road. Um, I don't know. If anything changed, it wasn't a conscious change. The weird thing about it, we had our whole lives to write the first record and we only had six months to write this one. So maybe that's why we sounded kind of pissed off on the record. <laughs> but uh, nothing's really changed as far as, I mean, lifestyle has changed a little bit, of course, because now we have some money and stuff like that, but the people haven't changed. What's the difference between making the last record and making this record, the five of you together? Well, the first album, it, it was our first, all of our first time really doing a record, so none of us had shit of a clue what to do. And um, I, for one, was real nervous the first time around, uh, just, you know, knowing that the whole world was going to hear the record, and that but since the whole world heard the record and the whole world liked the record, it made us a lot more confident this time around. And we actually had a clue of what to do when we came in the studio, you know. We had better ideas of how to get sounds. and it was just, We were just a lot more comfortable. How's your life changed from record one to record two? I'm richer. <laughs> Not rich, but 
I definitely can pay the rent now. <laughs> Riot Act was just, we just wanted to write something simple and stupid that, uh, I mean, we, a lot of stuff touches on the same stuff we did on the first record, but uh, we could take it to kind of a different level now. We could go a little more in depth, and it's just about how people used to piss us off and, and constantly just give us, you know, are we allowed to curse on this show? Mm -hmm. We used to give us uh, a little garbage uh, through our whole lives, and we thought that, you know, you become successful, maybe it'll change, but it don't. People still, you know, we just a riot act or whatever. Quicksand is a really heavy song for me. That song, it, it, that out of all the songs that we wrote, I think that one, even in counting the first record, that one took the longest. That one took about three or four months. And we want everything to be perfect with it. it uh, it's about, a lot of people think maybe it's about losing faith because of the title, but it's about keeping faith in God or whatever. And that, that's what that song's about. At the time of the rain, that's when the war started and, you know, all that other stuff was going on. You know, the acid rain and whatnot. And not getting real heavy or spaced out, but it... Um, you know, all these bad things happen in the world, and you're like, God, man, what, what do I have to have faith in? Why should I believe in something with all this bad stuff? But then it all comes out in the end, and you just have to. I really love a lot of them. I think my two favorites are uh, probably Slave to the Grind, the title track, and um, Quicksand Jesus. It's just, uh, it's just so intense, it's so aggressive. And it's just a fun song to play. It's it's just it's very angry sort of, just like everything else. And Quicksand is just very expressive. It's it's uh, I think the most expressive song that I've played with Skid Row. You know, as far as the drums, I remember you was was sort of like that, but it was kind of straight out. Quicksand, Jesus is I don't know the word for it. It just seems a little bit more artsy for Skid Row, you know, but. It's just, it's just a lot of fun, and it, it was more than just bashing. You know, it was real. It was, it's very musical. How's that? <laughs> we don't usually do musical things. We <laughs> a lot of stuff is really, you know, you hear it and you play it in rehearsal, and you're like, you know, it's cool. But then once you hear it on tape, where you don't have to be playing at the same time, and you can really critically listen to it. it everything sounded a lot better to me. Favorite yeah. lyric. Favorite lyric. Um, just about every lyric in Quicksand Jesus. I believe in God, but I wouldn't call me very religious. You know what I mean? I don't I don't go to church on Sundays, and I don't go uh, begging people to stop drinking and stuff like that. But that that song, all the lyrics in that. One of those songs that if I hadn't written, not to pat myself on the back or a snake on the back or anything, but if we hadn't written that, I wish we would have. You know what I mean? Like, I hear songs like Breakdown, I'm like, man, that's a great fucking song. That's a great song. I wish I wrote it or I hear, uh, you know, uh, any song, like Babylon, My Faster Pussycat. Every time I hear that song, I go, damn, I wish I wrote that song, you know? And Quicksand is one of those songs, if someone else did it, I would have done the same thing. Like, damn, I wish I wrote that. Just by watching this, then they would actually, I mean, it's not really personality that they, they're seeing our personalities, they're seeing our point of view, I think. And how did you get the title track? You guys must have had a lot of different names. We did. Um, how did we get the title track? We actually had a few names, and um, Slave to the Grind just... We had a bunch of uh, several different names, and I think one of the main reasons we used Slave to the Grind was just the words. It's just the way it sounded, the way it rolls, um, and you know, then the, and then also the meaning, you know, it, and and we just kind of, kind of like that. Like the lyrics say, you can't be king of the world if you're slave to the grind. You know, if you can't, you can't um, express. I mean, I suppose you can express yourself. I'm really getting lost in this one. <laughs> I know what I want to say. I'm just too hungover, Sharon. I didn't know I was supposed to do this. That too. No, you could cut me out of that one. You I'm gonna go. leave that all in. <laughs> <laughs> we were out for 17 months, and then we came home, and we were off for tops. I think six months, not even. And in that whole time span, there, 
you know, we were moving and getting stuff together and our, trying to get our own live, personal lives back together. And then just sat down on the couch one day and then it was like, bring, you know, let's rehearse. And it's like, okay, we're up again, you know. So it kind of does feel like it was just yesterday we got off the road. But you also get kind of antsy. You sit around, you're like, uh, uh. I mean, when we had to work, we worked really hard, I thought, when we had a rate. Because we were, like I said, we were kind of under the gun here, no pun intended. Under the gun, and we had to, uh, you know, get the songs together. And the same thing happened this time as did last time. We wrote what I, I thought were some of the, the better songs on the record within the last two or three months. Riot Act was within the last two weeks before we went to do the record. You know? Can't be king of the world if you're slave to the grind, and uh, you know it's basically chase, chase a dream, chase aspirations. But when I graduated college, I chose not to be a slave to the grind to be able to pursue music and hopefully make it. You know, give myself a chance while I was still young, and you know, say screw, screw the uh, the nine to five, and I just make it. You know, I'll just make the money however I can and hopefully someday it'll all work out for me and I'll do whatever, what I wanted to do all my life and somehow it happened. But it was because I gave it the chance. You know, I remember going to this record company, I went to, uh, I don't remember the record company, I think it was RCA, I went to apply for a PR job there and the guy said, you know, I went in with my long hair and uh, I'll never forget this, I wish I could remember the guy's name, he still, still may be there. And uh, he said, you know, he says, well you, you know, you look like you're a musician. I said, yeah, I am. And he said, well, he said, you're you're 22 years old. Why do you want to have a full-time job now? You know, if you really want to be a musician and play in a rock band and do that, why don't you just do it? And he said, there's plenty of plenty of time to work nine to five. He says, why don't you go do it now and find out if you can? And uh, that really, really helped me because I was, you know, I was in college, I was going to graduate, and it's like. Shit, I gotta get a real life, you know. And and then after he, he told me, I was like, shit, you know why? Let's let's see what happens first. And thank God, thank God I did. You know, I've been doing writing with people. I wrote a couple tunes with Alice Cooper and with Steve Jones. And uh, who else? I'm probably writing with Tammy from Faster and stuff like that. So I, I like to keep, you know, busy, definitely, so that this way you don't get the cable TV blues, you know. It's cool to, to uh, like work with other people because this way it broadens your mind too, you know. And this way when you go and sit down again and write for Skid Row, it's like, you know, you see different avenues to go that other people turn you on to, which is cool. Yeah. I, I know Snake wrote a tune with Nikki, and uh, he wrote with someone else, I think, too. But I would like to get into producing a little more when I get off the road. I just put a studio in my house, so I'm psyched. Most of the people I've met that I've looked up to have been pretty real, you know? Like, uh, Steve, I've always been a Pistols fan, and then, you know, when I met Steve Jones, he was, like, totally cool, and the same with Alice and stuff like that, so I was pretty happy. There was one guy I met that was in one of my favorite bands that really bummed me out, but I wouldn't even mention it. <laughs> Joy Hanson. <laughs> it comes down to choosing solos and stuff like that. I think the song really dictates it because we're pretty much two different players. I mean, we really are. I mean, I learn off him, and I hopefully he learns off me. Um, I'll go. He'll pull me in the studio a lot on this record, and I'll go, "What do you think about this, man? You think it's cool?" And I'll listen to it, and I'll go, "What are you high?" Yeah, this is great. This is amazing. I mean, you took me somewhere, and I'll be sitting there and going, right on, and I'll be yelling and screaming. And he's like, I'm not even going to ask you anymore, you know? It's like you're blowing smoke up my ass or something. I'm like, no, I'm not, man. I'm going, I'm really moved by what you're doing. Yeah. Just yeah. run with it, you know? And he's real critical of his own playing, like, and I guess I am too, because we both do the same thing. Like, I'll pull him in, I'll have him listen to his solo, and he'll, he'll do almost the same thing and, and I'll be like are you sure and we keep questioning it and like you know both of us in our situations Michael will sit there and go you guys are stupid you know you guys are just being stupid you're so I don't know whether it's insecure I'm sure it is 
you know, about your playing or whatever. I guess what it, a lot of it has to do with we just want to make sure that we're getting across everything that we want to. Where uh, a solo section can be taken so many different ways, but for us, it's like a section of a song where we can express what that song means to us. You know what I mean? And it's not being done through words, but you're trying to create a picture through your guitar playing. One of the guys that really helped me understand that was, was Sambora. I mean, Richie, if anyone, Richie's like in that class of players of like Eric Clapton and, and Neil Sean and, and David Gilmore and, and, and Jeff Beck were, they create pictures and, and colors through their, through their fingers, you know, and I, I listen to him play and, and I, I'm taken to like the way out of sphere, somewhere that I've never been before. He really taught me about the emotional side of playing that I kind of had by listening to, you know, guys like Neil Sean and David Gilmore and, and Clapton and Beck and, and Ace Frehley and, and, you know, the guys in Judas Priest. I mean, it's all, it should all depend on the song, you know, the structure of the song and, and what the song is about and where it's going. But, man, I mean, when a guy can just sit down there and, and you're sitting there and you're face to face with them and all you've got is two acoustic guitars and, and it's like four o'clock in the morning in Houston, Texas, in a hotel room, and this guy's playing can take you somewhere. I mean, and then you sit there and you're just rapping and you're jamming, and it goes to all these different places and creates all these pictures within your head. There's something special there, you know, and so it gives me something to strive for. My solos, the songs that I play solos on, tend to be like the more aggressive. Um, uh, I don't know, more upbeat tunes, you know, more the more in your face, uh, heavier stuff. That seems to be where my role of playing guitar in this band comes in as far as solos. All these songs, whether I've helped write them or not, still mean something really, I mean, will always mean something really special to me, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like we were in uh, practice the other day, and it was like the first time we've practiced since we played the show in uh, New Year's Eve in Japan, which is kind of like a, a shitty practice for us. <laughs> we were very good. <laughs> we were sitting there and we were we was playing, like mixing the new stuff with the old stuff. And it, Rachel goes, man, it's so weird calling this stuff the old stuff, you know, stuff off the first record right. because for so long we've been playing these songs and they've been such a big part of us for so long and now there's like the new things that are creeping into our lives, which is all these new stuff that we've written. And it's such a bizarre feeling because you play the new stuff and you're thinking about, oh man, I can't wait to hear what this sounds like on a stage and in front of people and stuff like that. And then you're hearing the old stuff and then you're going, it takes you to a place like, I don't know, I just remember the different things that would go on, you know, while we were playing some certain songs. and just the weird stupid stuff that we would do that no one ever knew about you know on stage and only it was between us and we'd just sit there and get a laugh out of it while we were doing certain songs and just certain times when we screwed up you know like when we played the Ritz in New York City and the band started one song and Rob started another one <laughs> that was a pleasure I um I don't I answer that <laughs> The night before Giant Stadium, I and mean, here we are playing in front of, you know, sold that show at the Ritz, and <laughs> we got off on the right foot. But, and I, I heard some, so many of Scotty's stuff that I truly love. I mean, just, he, I think he really, really grew as a player a lot. You know, I think people are going to be surprised at what they hear coming out of him, that's for sure. You know, not that he did anything subpar on the last record. He was amazing on the last record. I just think he took his playing one step further. Hopefully I've done the same thing. I think I've taken my end of the writing one step further, you know. I just hope my playing is um, is all relative to that as well.